It's okay. Good evening, everybody. It's very nice to see you all, and it's very nice to um, speak to those of you who are who are online. So, uh, for this very special occasion to celebrate Aaron's career, we as academics we only get promoted to chair once, only happens once, unless you're in Germany, I think. So, it's a very special occasion. It's a it's a kind of unique occasion, and so it's a very it, it really is a very special opportunity to celebrate one of our colleagues and, and a member of staff. So um, I think one of the pleasures about these events is that we spend our time as academics judging other people. It's called peer review. We spend our time doing peer review and it's really refreshing. And the, these events are an opportunity provided to do this for an individual to provide their own perspective on their own career. And I think they're really fascinating events. I think they're really, really enjoyable as events in their own right. So Karen was an original member of the Centre for Geography and Environmental Science before it's called that. Um, I think you're one of the three remaining members of staff who, who joined here in 2004. Yeah. Four. And um, I think, I think to the point where the centre has reached now, which is a really flourishing, fantastic department with really successful academics. I think Karen would agree that through external and internal pressures, um, it hasn't hasn't always been like that. And it's been it's been a, sometimes a bit of a struggle. But from the very beginnings, Karen has been one of the, 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 the sort of elements of the backbone, of this centre, which has led to its current its current flourishing. And um, I think that should not be forgotten, the contribution that she's made right from a very early stage in her career to the point where she is now as a professor within the department. I think a lot of the success of academic careers depends to some extent on serendipity and being in the right place at the right time. But being in the right place at the right time doesn't guarantee success and you need to be able to seize the opportunity. And I think Aaron's been in the right place at the right time in terms of the development of remote sensing, but in particular development of drone science. And boy, has she seized that opportunity. So um, the, 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 her, the testament to her success is, is, is being at the right place at the right time, but also making the most of that opportunity. Recently, uh, we had occasion to uh, anticipating yet another research excellence framework uh, um, exercise. We had uh, reason to look at research outputs across the, the not just the Centre for Geography and Environmental Science, the wider department. And uh, we we're reviewing numbers of outputs and it was sort of, you know, outputs four, five, six papers, whatever, over the review period. And then there were there were a couple of people who produced 25 papers over the review. And Karen was one of those. Karen is amazingly productive as a as a as a member of staff and of course fantastic quality as well. Yeah, I think the only final thing I want to say by way of introduction, and I hope Karen doesn't mind me saying this, she said to me once, you know, I'm just an ordinary girl from Essex, really. And I think that's only partially true because as undoubtedly you are from Essex, but you are actually an extraordinary girl from Essex. And we're going to find out why when you give this talk. So, Karen. Thank you. Thanks, James. Thank you. Thanks, James. Uh, that's a really nice introduction. And hi to everyone online. Um, I'm just going to quickly switch to Teams here. Can, can It's really great to see everyone. Hi, Brad. <laughs> hi, Debbie. Hi, everyone in crew. <laughs> hi, Dom. Um, can you hear me OK? I assume you can because you're waving. Fab. Right. Well, thanks so much for joining. Hi, Sasha. Um, so yeah, I I'm not going to lie that I I felt pretty nervous about uh, pulling this together actually, and it's quite difficult to build a bit of a retrospective of what is 
20 odd years of work and talk about it in 45 minutes um, without skimming over lots of detail. And I will be skimming over lots of detail today, um, partly because my daughter, Polly, is in the audience and she said, Mummy, please don't make it boring. So uh, I'm going to try to make it as interesting as possible uh, and as broad as possible. Um, and there is some Lego and Minecraft in this talk, which hopefully will be exciting for the younger and older audience members alike. Oh, I can switch my slide, hang on. There we go. OK, so um, it's hard to know where to start, actually, a lecture like this. And I, I you know, I, as I said, I was very nervous about doing this. Um, and so I'm starting with something slightly weird, which is a Grayson Perry pot. Um, and for those of you who don't know who Grayson Perry is, he's a very famous artist who won the Turner Prize. And a lot of his work is concerned with identity. And of course, uh, inaugural lecture is all about identity. It's about standing up here and saying, this is me. This is what contribution I've made to the world. And this is who I am. And to kind of try to prepare for this, I watched a lot of uh, introductions to inaugural lectures online. And what I um, that, that kind of deepened my existential void, actually, because um, a lot of people <laughs> start their lectures by saying I'm an, you know, I'm a world leading microbiologist or something. And um, I have a slight problem with that because when I looked at my career, I discovered that actually I was kind of bits and pieces of several things. I call myself a remote sensor, but I'm a drone pilot. Um, and I'm a geographer and I'm an environmental scientist and I'm also a coder, but I'm also a writer. I love writing and, you know, my personal life. I am a potter as well. Not a very good one, uh, but I, I am one. And so um, in sort of trying to come up with how to start this and thinking about identity, uh, I was helped a lot by Grayson Perry, actually, because a couple of weeks ago, we went to see his show at the Hall for Cornwall and it was a show all about identity. And one of the things he said in that in that show and in fact, the, the entire thing that it was about is that identity is actually about jigsawing together lots of different relationships and experiences and that we actually co-create our identity with other people. And I thought, yes, this is a great place to start because actually science is this, right? Science is, and academia generally is a collaborative endeavor. We rarely have um, original ideas on our own. Um, and when I look back across the kind of body of work that I've done, most of it is work that has been co-created with lots of other people. Uh, and so that's a happy place where I can start my inaugural lecture is by saying that actually everything I'm going to show you today is work and ideas and contributions that really have come from collaborations with lots and lots of people. And I'm starting out this talk intentionally by highlighting uh, all of the early career researchers who over the last 20 years I've had the joy of being able to work with. Um, I hope I've managed to get pictures of everyone on here. It was quite a challenge, actually. Um, uh, so um, everything I'm going to show you is just as much their work as it is mine. And that equally applies to uh, not just early career researchers, but other collaborators, people in the department, um, uh, postdoctoral post -doctoral researchers um, and other academic members of staff. And of course, also kind of not forgetting that this is a university, right? And, we, and more than half of what we do is working with undergraduate students. And so actually a lot of the things I'm going to show you are things that have been born out of dissertations. Uh, in the middle of the slide here is Kira Jeffries. She did a dissertation with me last year looking at gas fluxes on um, uh, the peatlands of Bodmin Moor. And uh, her work has informed some of the bigger project work that we're doing on peatlands and peatland restoration. So uh, this is their story too, right? And um, uh, I'm, I'm kind of quite happy to be able to say that I share my identity with all these people. The other thing that I think is worth saying as a sort of preface to all of this is that when I studied environmental science at University in Southampton in the 90s, I was taught on the whole by men. And when I um, applied for promotion to professor a couple of years ago, um, I paused to think about how uh, this, this has changed and, and how my field has changed. And it has changed, thankfully. 
but we still do have a kind of gender diversity issue in science. And in the field of remote sensing, I can only think of a handful, in fact, sort of two or three people who um, are female professors in my field. And this reflects a much wider systemic bias in science where numbers of women at senior levels don't reflect the more or less equal gender balance of students taking courses at more junior levels. Um, and so this same kind of systemic gender bias exists in academic publishing and, and all through the scientific system, including female representation on journal editorial boards, for example. Uh, so I feel quite proud to be able to kind of stand here as a woman in my field and talk to you about my story today. So um, James has stolen one of my headlines, which is that I am an Essex girl. I grew up just here. Uh, South End on Sea, on the Thames estuary, um, and I'm purposely using that term Essex girl because we need to change what we think of as an Essex girl, and I am one of them. Um, and uh, so I, I studied, uh, grew up here, studied um, biology, chemistry, geography uh, at A level, and had a really happy family upbringing in this part of the world. And actually, we would very regularly escape the confines of Essex and go into the hills and do lots of, you know, caravan adventures and hiking and all kinds of other things. I did a lot of kayaking in the Thames estuary with my friends as a teenager, but I suppose the writing was always on the wall that I was going to go into some kind of environmental field because actually these photos here I found during a recent house move for my dad. Uh, and I took hundreds of photos of things like this. So pictures of rivers, um uh microclimate experiments in the back garden and i remember dragging my parents out to survey this very channelized polluted brook in south end to find all of the sort of signs of pollution when i was about eight years old and so i was always into mapping and i was always into the environment and i even got a green blue, blue peter badge uh, when i was about 10 years old when they first uh, launched that scheme so i was pretty happy about that and, and I went uh, to the University of Southampton. I studied environmental science <clears throat> and I, I sort of focused on terrestrial ecology in my degree. And my third year dissertation was about uh, microclimate, vegetation, communities and butterflies. And Malcolm Hudson, shown in the picture just there, um, was one of my tutors at university and he was a great source of inspiration to me. But it wasn't until I sort of magically stumbled upon uh, a module called remote sensing in my second year that um, this whole field of um, making measurements of the Earth's surface from a distance was really opened up to me. And I was super lucky. Right. So there is a, there is a, a, a bit of luck in all of this, because as it turned out, uh, the tutor who was leading that module was basically a total legend of remote sensing, a guy called Professor Ted Milton. Um, he's really more of a physicist uh, than a, a geographer, perhaps. Um, he taught me everything I know about the fundamentals of making measurements of light. Um, and uh, he was the lead of the NERC field spectroscopy facility at the time. And it was during, you know, this um, this module that I took with him in, in my second year that I really uh, started to see the, the amazing science of remote sensing, which is that we can do kind of distant chemistry by measuring light signals. We can see inside of leaves to the, uh, uh, to the sort of biochemical constituents. We can measure the structure of ecosystems from different scales, and we can start to link all of those things together. So I found it really uh, compelling as a subject, and it's, of course, a very interdisciplinary subject that contributes a little bit to my kind of identity crisis, perhaps about who I am. And it was this image, actually, this is an image of a, a sort of erupting volcano in Japan that first opened my eyes to the magic of these images collected from above. You can see here so many different environmental processes that are kind of laid bare. Um, geomorphology, uh, hydrology, ecology, atmospheric science, it's all up there in this image. And so, um, uh, yeah, I've, I found that really dragged me into this uh, field with my uh, enthusiasm kind of wide open. So it might then come as a surprise that when I graduated, my first job had the job title Girl Friday. Uh, I moved back home to South End and because I needed some money, 
uh, I took a job at a local company and they, uh, uh, the, the job title was Girl Friday, which I'm pretty sure should not exist as a job title anymore, but it did in the 1990s. And it's basically office dogs party. Um, but I completely excelled at this job and it led to them offering me a job as the PA to the directors of this company. And this was a very big company. Uh, they did security and logistics for things like the Tate Gallery in London. So it was a very good opportunity. It was very well paid. But I then had a bit of a sliding doors moment. Now, I don't know if anyone has ever seen this film. How many people have seen it? It's a pretty bad film, right? It's not a good film. But in the film, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow has a moment where her life changes in a kind of split second and she misses a train or something and then her you know you see her life through these two uh diverging pathways and really I had a bit of a moment like this when they offered me the job as Girl Friday and I thought I don't think I really want to do this um it's going to take me in a direction that I don't want and uh, so what did I do? I got on the phone because that was what you did in the 90s. And I called up Ted in his office. Now, when I finished my degree, Ted said to me, you, you, you're really good at remote sensing. You should do a PhD. And I said to him, that's not what I want to do. I don't want to do a PhD. I want to do something else. And um, and then when I had this job offer, I thought maybe I do want to do remote sensing. So I rang him up and he said, it's it's fine. Come and work with me. I've got some jobs and, you know, you can slot into some of my projects and, you know, let's see how that goes. And so that's what I did. I basically uh, left the security and logistics company and I moved back to Southampton and I spent three years doing this. Uh, and this isn't actually a photo. I couldn't find a photo from the time. This is from the equivalent facility that now exists in Edinburgh. But Ted used to run uh, a NERC facility, which was the field spectroscopy facility. It was involved with calibrating and loaning out field spectro radiometers, um, calibrating airborne remote sensing instruments as well, and training people in how to collect remote sensing measurements in the field. And I spent three years basically doing this and working with Ted on various campaigns uh, to support lots of different remote sensing experiments with lots of different universities across the, the UK and the EU. And it was this experience over those three years that sort of led me to learn some really fundamental things about data uncertainty, quality assessment in remote sensing data, and fundamentals of precise measurement. And I was working there with um, another scientist called Liz Rollin, who was a really fantastic kind of female role model for me at the time. Anyway, eventually, Ted encouraged me to do a PhD. And I eventually decided that this was a good path for me and that I really enjoyed doing research. And so I spent three years of my life uh, standing on this little bit of concrete that you can see at the bottom of this uh, image. This is an airborne remote sensing image from a multispectral scanner. And this is Thorny Island, which is a military site that um, sticks out into Chichester Harbour on the south coast of England. Um, and you might wonder what on earth I was doing standing on a bit of concrete for three years. And this is what I was doing. Um, this trolley uh, generally cracks a bit of a smile in our family because it was a funny, funny old thing. But um, the, go the goal of this experiment was really to track dynamic changes in the reflectance of the calibration surface over time. And that required me to be able to position these spectrometers very precisely over the same bit of concrete. And you... Uh, you know, you might think concrete's a really boring thing. And I, I must admit, I started out thinking, what on earth am I going to discover here? But actually, what I learned is that concrete uh, shows some very dynamic behaviour, particularly in response to things like solar zenith angle, sky haze, and also it greens up uh, during the course of a day, actually, sometimes, and of course, over the seasons uh, due to the presence of algae. And so, uh, the PhD wasn't entirely about the reflectance of this tiny bit of concrete, of course. It was about how we scale up from that understanding to calibrate sensors and so on uh, on board uh, 
uh, aircraft and, and in space. Um, and so I learned an awful lot about the fundamentals of remote sensing measurements doing uh, this work. And then I joined the geography department here in Penryn in 2004 uh, amongst a small but very dedicated group of geographers. Predominantly, and we basically, as James was saying, we built this place from the ground up, really. Um, I guess the, the key thing to say is that um, at that time and for about 10 years afterwards, I think I was the only female physical geographer in the Department of Geography at Exeter. And um, and so I'm pleased to say that that's something that has also changed in more recent years. And three things happened in those first uh, few years at Exeter. <clears throat> um, sorry, actually, I think it might be four things uh, that really sort of set me on a path to what I'm doing now. The first one was um, that uh, I supervised my first PhD student, um, Holly Croft. Uh, and that was because a really amazing soil scientist at Exeter, Klaus Kuhn, reached out to me when I first joined the department and he said, I really, I'm really into space and I want to work with someone who does remote sensing. And so uh, actually what we ended up doing had nothing to do with satellites really whatsoever. It was about using spectrometers to measure the changing reflectance of soil surfaces during uh, erosion of um, erosion experiments, basically, and that formed Holly's PhD. And I learned an awful lot about supervising PhDs um, as a result of that. I kind of I was riding blind a little bit, to be honest, at the beginning. Uh, 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 that being my first ever supervision. The next thing was I got my first NERC grant, uh, and that allowed me to work with John Benny, who is still a member of our geography department. Uh, he's really a kind of spatial ecologist but uh, or a biogeographer maybe is a better uh, description and we spent a bit of time on peatlands looking at peatland structure and function using laser scanning and although that is a kind of artistic rendering of what we did we did actually put a laser scanner on a tracked vehicle and drive it across a peatland and th there were there's lots of side stories to uh, to that <laughs> one of which involved us hiding under some bushes during a lightning storm. Um, so uh, the other thing that was really cool was that I got some funding from the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust to go and work uh, at NASA Ames in, uh, in California. And I worked with a hero of mine, really, uh, Jennifer Dungan. Uh, she was part of the Landsat science team, and I spent about two and a half months working with her doing some experiments. Again, you'll see the spectrometer is there pretty much in all of these measurements. So really fine grained, close range uh, remote sensing measurements, looking at uncertainty in vegetation uh, reflectance factors. And this was a, a sort of experience that I won't ever forget because it was just amazing as a remote sensing scientist to be inside NASA for eight weeks. I was totally awestruck really by that. Um, and then uh, finally, I participated in a load of um, uh, spectral measurement campaigns, which were funded by uh, cost actions and other projects. So working in sites across northern Europe, really, uh, and, and with lots of collaborators from across Italy and other European countries. Uh, we ran summer schools, teaching people how to do this kind of thing. We did lots of intercomparison experiments and um, uh, and, and we were working on linking spectral data with things like flux tower measurements. And this is work that's kind of prevailed through some of my more recent work in dry land systems. So in what remains of the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about a few uh, key things that that we've done uh, through my career. And uh, I haven't got time to cover everything, so I tried to classify this into kind of four key themes. Firstly, I'm going to start with looking at kind of work we've been doing on peatlands. Then I'm going to talk about the work that we've been doing developing drone methodologies. Uh, then I'm going to talk about work in mountain systems and then work with laser scanners. And just because I know we've got quite a diverse audience today, I thought I might spend like one minute just explaining basically some of the concepts I'm going to talk about from here on. So first of all, you might hear me talk about laser scanning or LIDAR. Laser scanning is basically uh, a distance measuring device. Um, they tend to be 
uh, housed on aeroplanes, although there are space lasers as well. Um, and they provide us with information about topography and canopy attributes at about one meter spatial resolution. I might talk, well, I will be talking about drones quite a lot and drones uh, are equipped usually with red, green, blue cameras. So they're flying cameras, but they fly much closer to the surface, usually about 100 metres or less above the ground. The typical spatial resolution being about one centimetre per pixel. And the cool thing about drones and the drone data is that we can now use computer vision workflows to stitch those data together into structural volumetric models by exploiting information uh, in the parallax domain, which is basically in the overlapping areas of the photos. And then finally, I will be talking a little bit about satellite data and mostly Landsat um, and the data concerned there are much coarser in terms of their grain at about 30 metres per pixel. And here we're talking about the measurement of reflected light from the Earth's surface in different wavelengths. So let's get on to the science bit um, and I'm going to start with peatlands and this is a really nice image that was collected by Pia Bernode who um, is joining this talk from up in Exeter. She's part of the crew centre. <coughs> um, and this picture was captured from a drone and it shows a peatland on Dartmoor. Uh, the restored area is in the foreground and the, in the background we have an unrestored area. I think peatlands are amazing systems. I've always been really astonished by the variety of plant life on peatlands. I'm really keen to do work that sort of uncovers their hidden story. And so for about 10 years, I've been collaborating with um, a whole team of people uh, at Exeter, led by Richard Brazier, but in collaboration with Southwest Water. Uh, various people have done their PhDs on this. And what we're doing in those projects is trying to build an evidence basis for blanket peatland restoration, and we focus very heavily, of course, on southwest peatlands. And this is because in the UK, peatlands are in a really dire state. About 80% of uh, our peatlands are degraded. And uh, we're part of a big project which is about upstream thinking. So can we restore peatlands to uh, reduce connectivity, increase residence time of water and hopefully carbon in these systems? and uh, you know have societal benefits and also water system benefits so my role here is obviously in the remote sensing department to incorporate the kind of spatial data into that information system uh, and we combine data from lots of different um, uh, lots of different systems drones aeroplanes satellite data with lots of ground-based measurements as well describing water flows and stores and gas fluxes as well <coughs> And so what you can see in this image is that in the foreground, there's loads of ponds of water and we can see that the, the effect that restoration has had uh, on this particular peatland. And although um, overall more water is held in the landscape as a result of the restoration, we have found that there are much more complex patterns of water storage and carbon fluxes and that the hydrological dynamics can vary over quite fine scales and the drone data have helped us to kind of uncover that. So one of the things that we know about peatlands is that when they're in a degraded state, the surface structure will change. And this is quite a good indicator of the hydrological status of peatlands. And it's something that we can remotely sense with laser scanning uh, because laser scanning measures the distance to things so it can tell us about these structures. And knowing where these degraded structures exist can help inform restoration. Now, if you look at this picture, it shows an enhanced surface model. Let me just take that one off of uh, a section of, of peatland on Dartmoor. And you, this is derived from laser scanning. You might be able to see the structures that are visible. But if I just bring those to life for you, what you will see is that there's quite extensive structures across this system. And these are all indicators of damage, things like peat erosion gullies, drainage ditches and so on. Um, go into a bit more detail. So we mapped all of these across the whole of Dartmoor using laser scanning data that are freely available uh, from the UK government. And the main finding is that over Dartmoor's extent, about 29 kilometres squared or 9% of the Dartmoor peatland area is significantly eco-hydrologically degraded. And this is a problem because these peatlands are sources of CO2 
Um, they're sources of uh, soil erosion, of course, when it rains, there's a lot of expedited flow that goes down these channels and it takes the peat away and into downstream watercourses. Uh, and that further degrades the peatland. So there's a kind of feedback system. So blocking up these ditches is a, is a priority, both for water and for carbon. Um, and uh, we really need to kind of change and address that um, using restoration. But of course, uh, the kind of uh, big, uh, the big story about this is that we really need to stop extracting peat from peatland systems in the first place. And so, uh, I'm sure most people in this audience are very aware of this, but um, one really big thing that we can all do to reverse this trajectory of change is to just stop buying peat and actually lobby our garden centres to stop stocking peat. Um, and I think that the manager of the Con and Downs Garden Centre is a bit fed up with me because I, every time I go there and I see that they have got peat based compost, I have to have a word with somebody about that and uh, it's just amazing that this is still uh, up for sale even though legislation is thankfully changing um, in this regard. So uh, yeah please buy peat free wherever possible. Other work that we've done in peatlands exploits different parts of the spectrum so this is work that Dave uh, Luscombe has done quite a few years ago now for his PhD but I still think it's really neat. Uh, this is using uh, emitted thermal radiation to measure patterns of water uh, in peatlands and this is also combined with some uh, some lidar data as well to uh, normalize out differences in structure that might give rise to different kind of temperatures um, but basically what this shows is that we can remotely detect uh, surface water content using uh, emitted thermal radiation um, and this is also a very useful bit of information if we want to then target restoration. Uh, here's some other work that we've been doing across Southwest Peatland. So this is work that Naomi has been doing. And uh, of course, in Peatlands, a lot of the important stuff is happening below the surface, right? So everything I've shown you so far is a kind of surface representation of processes. But really in Peatlands, what we need to know is how deep is the peat? And that's very important for understanding how much carbon is stored in these systems. So using passive gamma ray spectroscopy, uh, Naomi has been doing work that allows us to measure peat depth at um, improved resolutions. And basically what we found from this is that um, about 150 kilometers squared worth of uh, Dartmoor comprises peaty soil that's more than 40 centimeters in depth. And from that, we can scale up to carbon estimates. Um, this basically means that about 13 megatons of carbon are stored in these peaty soils. And that is a revised estimate based on, on uh, Naomi's peat depth work that uh, uh, is, is an increase on previous estimates due to the greater modeled peat depth that we can get from these remote sensing measurements. So, um, I think these are some quite nice examples. They're not the only ones, but I haven't got time to talk about everything that we've been doing in UK peatlands. Um, I want to kind of just expand the focus, though, to show you a couple of things that we've been doing in peatlands elsewhere. So this is a big project uh, funded by the Natural Environment Research Council and a collaboration with Angela Gallego Sala and Catherine Crichton at Exeter. <coughs> We've been working uh, on Arctic peatlands from Svalbard to northern Canada to try to answer a question about whether these Arctic peatlands are expanding under climate change. And here the remote sensing again is just a small bit of a wider puzzle linking with lots of other ground based observations. So peat cores, for example, and vegetation surveys on the ground. And um, data from the satellite record here seems to suggest that these Arctic peatlands are on the whole greening up as well as expanding laterally in response to climate change. And of course, the Arctic is at the front, uh, the leading edge of, of warming in climate change. And so this has major ramifications for what might happen with regards to kind of carbon cycle processes in these cold regions as they rapidly warm up. Um, the core thing here really is that what we're doing in the remote sensing is linking different scales of data together. So um, to measure P 
peatland greenness from space is quite challenging and it requires really detailed validation data from the ground. And we do that uh, using drones. Um, and so some of these images that you can see uh, are data that we collected with drones. We're also working in tropical peatlands with partners in central Kalimantan, and this is a global challenges research fund project to, to query peatland eco hydrological conditions and things like fire risk. Um, and this is Magda's work, um, but we're also working with scientists in Indonesia like Kitso, uh, you can see on the slide there. And what we're doing here is actually leveraging different information from radar sensors. So radars work in a similar kind of way to laser scanners, but they use microwave wavelengths. And using radar, we can sense movement in the peatland surface. And that's what you're seeing on these maps here is um, movement that relates to either the peat surface falling over time or the peat surface swelling over time. Falling is red, swelling is blue. I think I got that right, Magda, didn't I? Yeah. And green is not really moving very much. And of course, peatlands that are intact um, will behave in a certain way, and peatlands that are more degraded will behave in a different way. Um, and so uh, what we're doing is we're using these very, very precise, and we're talking kind of millimetre precision here, uh, estimates of peat swelling and peat um, subsidence to come up with kind of uh, strategies for addressing some of the peatland degradation problems in these uh, in these tropical areas. And these are quite complicated areas because you've got high population density, tropical forests, lots of conversion of peat swamp to agriculture and so on. And so the remote sensing is a really uh, useful toolkit for starting conversations around large scale restoration. And again, we see drone data coming in here. So these are actually Kitso's data that he's collected uh, for us uh, to show us what the land cover is like in certain parcels. Uh, and we're using that to validate what we're seeing from space. So that brings me on to drones, um, because I've talked a little bit about drones uh, and how we're using those with satellite data. Um, but I've been working with drones as kind of Tool, remote sensing tools in their own right since about 2011 and actually the first time we flew a drone some of the people uh, in the room may remember this uh, it was on Exmoor and uh, we crashed it <laughs> we literally launched it and it nosedived down to the ground and destroyed all of the sensors on board and so we've learned a lot uh, over a decade of experimentation with these bits of technology and as part of my move into the ESI uh, the ESI is the Environment and Sustainability Institute on this campus. I moved there in, I think, about 2012 and I set up um, the drone lab. And it was through various PhDs and research projects here that I've sort of learned so much about drones. And in that time, James sort of alluded to this as well, drones have also massively changed. So back in 2012, we were building our own drones out of bits and pieces like this. And Andy Cunliffe's in the audience. and. He will remember very well that I said, I've got this great idea, Andy, you could go and um, fly a drone over some dry land systems in New Mexico. Here's a box of stuff. And then Andy basically soldered it together and had various <laughs> mini disasters of his own. No doubt these will be tales he tells in his own inaugural lecture in years to come. Um, uh, and it was very much a kind of hobbyist kind of technology that we adopted for science. And now, the technology has moved on so much, right? We now have drones like this, which you can get out of a box, plug a battery in, and they're ready to fly in like three minutes or something. And they're super small and they have really good cameras. But ultimately, um, neither of these things were built for science, right? These are either things built for the hobbyist, you know, um, radio controlled aircraft community on the left, or things that people fly for fun at the weekends to capture pictures of themselves mountain biking or something on the right. And so um, within a scientific workflow, we have to do quite a lot of work to turn data from these things into products. And I suppose most of our biggest kind of drone experiments uh, or maybe the longest running ones have been here in New Mexico 
And it's not called the land of enchantment for nothing. It is an unbelievable place. I've, it's one of my favorite places in the whole world. It doesn't look like there's much there, but it's an incredible place to have the privilege to work. Um, and most of my adventures in New Mexico have been with Andy Cunliffe and also Richard Brazier. And I feel very grateful to have spent so much time there. So let's get on to what kinds of stuff we've done. So. This goes back quite a, while, quite a way, maybe 2014, 2015, Andy was doing this work for his PhD. Uh, I think it's a really nice way of showing um, what drone data can do and what, what it can tell us about. And this project was really driven by questions about above ground biomass dynamics in dry land systems and trying to work out uh, how much carbon is stored in these systems and of course the plant structures and the size and the shape of those plant structures can tell us a lot about the biomass. So exploiting that Im image parallax from these two dimensional and it's just aerial photos, right? We can stitch them together using um, computer vision workflows and we can then use these volumetric products to tell us about plant structure and carbon. And so, um, so yeah, that, this is the cool thing about that technique. We don't need to cut down plants. Basically, what we're doing is we are weighing plants by flying over them with a drone. So it's a non-destructive way of estimating, uh, of estimating biomass. And if we look at the kind of relationships that we get, I'm not going to put too many graphs up today, but these are some relationships that Andy derived between above ground biomass um, and things like plant volume for different species. And so uh, this provides us with a way of quite rapidly scaling uh, over fairly large areas, some of these critical kind of biomass estimates. And I think it's important to say that doing this in, in dry land systems by other remote sensing means is virtually impossible. Uh, LIDAR data do not work well here because the laser beam goes through most of the plant um, and therefore you don't get an accurate estimate of height. Um, and satellite data perform really poorly because there's loads of soil background and which messes up the signal basically. Um, so kind of buoyed up by the fact that pretty much every single department on Earth, by you know, biology department, geography department, natural sciences department now contains a drone and someone who can fly it, um, Andy uh, led an experiment uh, to crowdsource a load of data across dry land systems, generally speaking, dry land systems across the world. So we engaged, I think, about 50 or 60 different partners. They all went out with their drone. They captured a load of data. We processed it and we put it through our algorithm following a standardised protocol, and we, we were able to come up with these sort of standardized allometric relationships that relate things like mean canopy height derived from the drone to biomass for, for major plant classes. And I think that's a really cool example of how, OK, we're talking about fine scale measurements, but we can do really big science and answer really big questions with um, with these fine scale data. Um, of course, when you fly a drone, it's not just a drone. When we invest in this workflow and in this technology, we invest in, in everything from choosing the right sensor to processing the data, deploying the calibration targets and, and so on. And so this is quite a different workflow from what we have to do if we just download a ready to use product from a website, like a you know satellite product, for example. Um, and so I think a lot of my sort of basic training in doing some of those really fundamental remote sensing measurements has led to me being able to kind of capitalise on drone technology. But of course, no, um, <clears throat> no scientific experiment just looks like like this. OK, this is how we might want everybody to think we do things. But of course, the truth of it is that we spend a lot of time in places like Walmart. <clears throat> um, combing the uh, the oven tray rack for, uh, for for aluminium trays that we can then dry our samples in or testing out and looking at the precision of different types of bathroom scales for measuring bits of wood that we cut down uh, that we need to measure in the field. Um, so, uh, you know, not all of the stuff that we do is really high tech. And in fact, we, we probably, Andy particularly, has walked, I guess, hundreds of miles over dry land surfaces pushing wheelbarrows and I've done my fair stint of that too. 
OK, so along with all that drone allometry work, we've also done lots and lots of other things with drones, and I haven't got time to talk about all of them, but most of these involve basic camera systems or multispectral sensors. So measuring plants in hard to reach places like James Duffy's PhD on uh, surveying seagrass and um, intertidal sediments. Uh, or multispectral monitoring of really fine grained um, uh, phenology and tree canopies. And then Nicola's work looking at connectivity in grasslands. And all of that led to us being invited to write a report for the WWF about drones for conservation. And this is a piece of work that I'm really proud of because it's a very sort of open source and generalised report that, that uh, shares all of our expertise on drone monitoring. I've also done quite a bit of work on advocacy, so trying to change sort of gendered language within the drone field. It was very much a boys and their toys sort of field when I first started working in this field. So with Karen Joyce, we've done some work on that. Uh, and also with Brad, um, I'm really proud of this paper. This is quite an interdisciplinary paper, um, uh, which was <laughs> very harshly received by reviewers from across the geography discipline um, because it, it tries to cross that divide between human and physical geography. Um, and we, we wrote this really because we were motivated by the fact that for a long time, human geographers have been critiquing the drone from a standpoint of its military history. And yet right across the corridor from every human geographer exists a physical geographer who's flying drones for different purposes. And so we tried to kind of engage that uh, uh, that um, that nexus of, of <laughs> geographic imagination, I suppose, and write about the drone from those two different standpoints. But I think it's really interesting to work with um, people who have, you know, different backgrounds to you and different viewpoints and to take those on board. And when I was writing this, I, I actually just stumbled upon a new story which made me think again about drones, because in that piece that Brad and I wrote, we basically said, uh, you know, these geography drones that we're using to survey ecosystems, they have diverged from their evolutionary history from these military uh, military vehicles that are used as, you know, instruments of war and for killing things, and, and they are evolved. But of course, the drones um, have this shared history, right, with these military machines. And then you see news stories in conservation that pop up like this, where consumer drones are fitted with things like rat poison uh, and they are used also in a conservation setting as these kind of killing machines. And so it's a reminder for sure that technology is constantly evolving and sometimes there's a throwback, right? And this is something that we need to really think about as people who engage technology in our work. And it's our responsibility as scholars to do that, because I think this is a, you know, a harking back to that uh, <clears throat> So that drones as vehicles for for killing, for aerial killing. So now I want to go to the mountains. This is another place I've been very lucky to spend some time in Nepal. And pretty much all of my mountain adventures have uh, included another human being in the name of Stefan Harrison, who's not here. He's in North Wales in some other mountains right now. Um, and it all started with us looking at these features just here. This is a rock glacier. These are ice cored features covered in debris. And this is a kite that we're using to survey the rock glacier. And what you can't hear in this picture is the Sherpa saying very, very danger. Um, <laughs> and so we've had a lot of <clears throat> what might be called type three fun in mountain systems. Uh, and uh, this was one of those particular days. So, um, Together with our PhD students, Darren and Sally, we have been working over 10 years to survey rock glaciers. These are features that are hidden in plain sight, but you can see them on satellite images and we've used Google Earth to map them. And what Darren and Sally uh, have shown is that Sally was working in Bolivia. She found 90 or so previously unmapped Bolivian rock glaciers that we could find on Google Earth. And even the local water agency uh, hadn't seen those before. And Darren found in excess of 6,000 rock glaciers and 20, uh, 6,000 in Nepal and 25,000 across the Himalayas by doing a systematic mapping of those regions using Google Earth. 
So these things are, you know, really important for the water supply uh, in these arid mountain systems and hydrologically, hydrologically valuable long term water stores, but uh, as yet um, overlooked in many of the climate models. And then things got a bit planty because when I was doing field work with these guys, I, I noticed that I was standing in this amazing alpine system surrounded by plants that looked a little bit like kind of systems where we were doing dry land research. These are not necessarily dry lands, they're temperature limited systems. But it got me thinking about that kind of hydrolog hydrology ecology connection. And uh, we did some work using Landsat satellite data to query just really simply are there more plants in these systems now than there were in the past? And we were using the Landsat archive to do that. And what we found indeed is that um, uh, basically these mountains are greener than they were in the past. Um, and this led to a moment in my life that I never thought would happen, which is that I woke up one morning and Leonardo DiCaprio had <laughs> retweeted about my work. Uh, to 40 million people worldwide. So the Guardian wrote an article about it and then Leonardo DiCaprio tweeted it. And that was um, a little bit of a heart stopping moment, not least because the Guardian headline was slightly wrong. OK, but it's not what we don't know if it's grass. We can't tell what kind of plants are growing in these 30 meter pixels, but we do know that the land is greener than it was in the past. So that was a big moment. And this is work that's now being continued by Rowling for her PhD, looking at these eco hydrological interactions in uh, Himalayan systems. We're still prevailing with the kite. And I probably should explain that that is a replacement drone because there's not really any places to charge batteries in these high altitude regions. Um, suffice to say, there were lots of different difficult adventures in these places. Um, involving several room 101s, one of which um, some very bad stuff happened, uh, requiring rescue by this uh, friendly chap, the horse. Um, and I can confirm that Nepalese dogs, they like jelly babies. Um, and we also met some fabulous people, really. So uh, this research really could not have happened without people like Karka, uh, Mahesh, and then these uh, two guys, Dilip and Kancha Sherpa, are currently deploying our, these are just trail cams, but we've put them on the roofs of their tea houses and they are capturing data for us so that we can track vegetation phenology and snow pattern dynamics in these systems again for Roland's PhD. Okay, so on to the last bit really. Um, I'm going to talk about lasers and then I'm going to bring it to a close. I'm sure you're all desperate for a drink in a moment. Um, Laser scanning is something that I've often loved and spent a lot of time uh, working with. And I just really want to give a bit of a shout out here to the kind of work that's going on in the team at the moment, um, not least the work that Dave Luscombe has been doing, which is funded by a, a project on net zero. So this is all about how much carbon is stored within landscapes in the UK. And we were tasked as part of a, a much bigger project to come up with a, a method to map all of the trees in the UK. And so um, Dave has taken it upon himself to uh, build a load of LIDAR data, laser scanning data, along with some satellite data into a, a freely available online tool. And if you're interested in it, you can go to his app at the bottom there to basically volumetrically um, discriminate different elements of the UK treescape. Um, and, and, and I'm only showing you a segment of this for the Penryn and Falmouth area, but this is basically a national map. Uh, so we can you can zoom in on anywhere in England at the moment. He's added Wales and look at the treescape. And this is proving to be a very popular tool uh, for uh, for people to use um, to understand carbon distribution in landscapes. And I guess to say we're also using terrestrial laser scanners to kind of validate those data. Finally, um, I just want to kind of talk very briefly about this because it's quite a cool project that led to Steve Hancock uh, going on to work at NASA and getting a job kind of doing similar coding to this for the JEDI sensor that's on the International Space Station. Um, this was a project with Kevin Gaston, various others, and Steve Hancock was the postdoc on it. And this was using 
a different type of laser scanner, a waveform laser scanner that's a bit more sophisticated than the normal standard laser scanners that are out there, because what it does is it measures the full signal between and the time varying signal between the top of the canopy and the ground. So we get all of these bits of information that exist within the canopy that tell us about the full three dimensional structural attributes of the canopy. And I have to say this was an idea that I had um, when uh, Kevin was putting in the BEST grant uh, and I conceptually understood how to do it, but I didn't really have the skills to code up the really detailed physics that allows you to pull out these, uh, these um, volumetric estimates of vegetation. So that's all on Steve, really. He's an amazing coder and physicist and basically did all the signal processing, all of the calibration and linking with terrestrial laser scanning data that Matt Disney helped us to collect. Um, I, I could get very complicated here, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to show you something very simple and conceptual. So most remote sensing data, if you think of a Lego world, would be like this. They're two dimensional rasters that tell us about a pixel and its value in space. But what, what's cool about the voxel data is they're basically like this, right? So instead of a 2D plane, we actually have volumetric pixels or voxels and in, within each one of those stacked up on top of each other with Steve's technique, we can work out how much plant life is present within each of those volumetric pixels. But that's really cool until you come to trying to visualize it because basically the visualization in some of the standard GIS packages is just a series of 2D layers and you can't really put them together to tell you what the uh, what the treescape looks like. And so this is where we started working with Amber and Dave, who uh, who run an independent uh, scientific organization called Then Try This down in Penryn, and they helped us to come up with some really creative ways of viewing the data. So I'm going to pod this round. You can have a look at them. Um, and what these show are the urban green space volumetric patterns of some of the most exciting towns in the UK, Luton, Bedford and Milton Keynes, right? Um, and, uh, and so these are using kind of arts based tools, three dimensional printing or uh, reductive CNC milling, you can see in some of the photos here. But also they came up with the brilliant idea that um, actually there are already computer programs that allow us to see the world in 3D. And those are things like Minecraft. So Minecraft is actually a world that is built out of voxels, volumetric pixels. So we started to do that as well, put some of these data into Minecraft to see what the cities would look like. And these provided very engaging ways for general, uh, for the general public to kind of engage with these very technical uh, derived uh, LIDAR volumetric models. OK, so I'm coming to the end now. Um, I'm going to finish up with something slightly different, which is that with remote sensing, we always tend to think about the Earth from a vantage point like that, like this. Everyone is familiar with the blue marble. This is the image that really, you know, kickstarted the environmental revolution, the fragility of the Earth from space. But that's not quite right, actually. Right. So the Earth doesn't look like this from space anymore. We are living in an age of mega constellations where space is a new billionaire playground. OK, and space or rather the Earth from space actually looks more like this. There are 11,000 orbiting objects around the Earth and one and a half thousand of these are solely up there for the purpose of capturing Earth observation data to provide people like me uh, with um, environmental science information. And we've learned a lot about our planet from this vantage point. Images from the Earth, sorry, images of the Earth from space have changed our understanding of all kinds of things, as I've hopefully shown. But as an environmental scientist, it would be remiss of me, uh, someone who uses these data, to not really own up to the environmental impact of the work that I do. And I think as, as academics and as scientists, we have a responsibility, like I explained with the drone, 
to not just use technology passively, but to engage it critically. Um, and uh, thankfully, I'm part of an institute here which is full of interdisciplinary scientists. And our goal in the ESI is to think critically about solutions to problems of environmental change. And so together with these colleagues, we have been looking at this space infrastructure and querying and trying to quantify some of those life cycle impacts. Uh, things like launching uh, emissions, things like, you know, once the satellites are in space, then the light pollution that they give rise to, the impact of ground infrastructure, receiving stations, and of course, data centres. This is where the cloud touches the ground, and this is where I and many other people do their remote sensing analyses. And this is a concern because remote sensing data are on the upturn, right? This is something I just pulled down today. It shows data from the Planet Labs website. They operate 200 mini satellites in space. And you can see that over the last five days, there are multiple images from space collected over Falmouth. When you start to scale that up to the entire Earth observation ecosystem, you can see that we have got a major challenge on our hands, right? Um, this links to some really fundamental questions in remote sensing. Does more data or finer resolution data equal better quality information? How much redundancy are there in these data sets? And how are we going to look after all these data uh, once it's back on Earth? Because the data will outlive all of these satellites once these satellites are burnt up in the atmosphere. Not only that, as I said, we're also processing data increasingly on the cloud. And so just to finish up, I want to show you some data that Magda and others have been pulling together, which is that we calculate that totally the, the amount of data in the Earth observation ecosystem is about 800 petabytes at the moment. And just to store those data on a cloud centre for one year emits as much carbon dioxide emissions as flying from London to New York 5,000 times. So 4,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions. And that doesn't include any of the processing that we do on the cloud. It doesn't include any of the downloading. It doesn't include the carbon costs of the computer hardware itself. So we need to shine a light on this dark side of Earth observation. And we need to start delving into what the benefits of Earth observation are versus what the costs, um, as we've seen. OK, so just to finish up, um, I want to say thank you to some very specific people. Um, all that there is to say really about that is to kind of come back to Grace and Perry's point that identity is a jigsaw of relationships and experiences. And I have been very lucky uh, here at Exeter and before I moved to Exeter to have felt very nurtured by a lot of wonderful colleagues and friends. And um, my story is shared with all these people. They have shaped my imagination. They have changed the way I think about things. They've given me new opportunities and opened up doors for me. And obviously my family and my dearest friends um, are also a source, source of great support and inspiration. OK, and I started with pottery and I'm going to finish with pottery because I'm not just a scientist. I am lots of other things, too, one of which is a very um, mediocre potter, but I'm keen. That's the main thing. Um, and uh, I go to Truro College once a week and I do an adult education course with some really amazing people and I have an amazing teacher, but it produces a very large quantity of material, shall we say, um, and it's filling up our cupboards at home and I've uh, been asked to find a, uh, a way of adopting some of this into new homes. <laughs> And so uh, in the spirit of that, um, in the coffee room where we're going to go in a minute, uh, there are a selection of pots that are available for new homes. And I'm giving these, uh, giving them away. But if you feel that you are able to uh, make a small donation to cancer research in exchange for a pot or a plant, then uh, please do. And that's in memory of some important people. I should say the plants are obviously all in peak free compost. So that is <laughs> quite a critical point. So I'm going to finish there. Thank you. I've gone on a bit too, a bit longer than I hoped, but. Uh...
Hello, can everyone hear me? This is Stefan Harrison here. I'm. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can, Stefan. Thank you. Right, good. Um, well, um, I'm not going to put my my picture, my camera on because I'm stuck in a small place in North Wales, and I, I think the internet is a bit uh, dodgy here. But I, I, I'm, I want to say first of all, I'm very honoured to be asked to give the vote of thanks, Karen. I, I thought that was a uh, tremendously thoughtful and insightful um, uh, and enormously wide-ranging talk and I think you did an extraordinarily good job so you should definitely be uh, congratulated for that. I, I, I sort of I remind I'm, I'm reminded of the of what um, the very uh, well the, the dead now Dennis Healy famous uh, Labour politician said about good politicians. Good politicians he said should have a hinterland and uh, and you've demonstrated that scientists should have a hinterland too. So your last few slides about your interests in pottery and your interests in and uh, just sort of fit you, the fit the sort of the sort of person you are that the fact that you've dem you've demonstrated enormously wide ranging and 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 uh, 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 wide ranging sets of interests. Yet they all seem to fit together. And and I think that's quite rare amongst scientists. Quite scientists often become quite isolated, and and compartmentalised. And you haven't done that. And I thought that was a a really excellent way of showing of showing that. I say I can't be there. I'm working on a rock, a rock glacier, which of course you you will understand why I can't possibly say not work on a rock glacier when given the opportunity. But so I, I I'll I'll keep this short. But first of all, I want to thank. Um, uh, Jen uh, Milsom and her team uh, for organising and supporting much of this, much of the admin of all these these talks it sort of goes under the radar a bit, and that's thanks to 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 the great team of administrators we have, um, uh, and also the, the people who've turned up online. And it's great to see some of my former PhD students. I think I'm looking at Sasha now, so it's good to see Sasha and others uh, online, uh, and also the people at, at uh, Trimo campus. Uh, and I wish I was I was there. Um, you're a very modern scientist, Karen. Uh, I, I, I'm old enough to remember scientists who got very, very interested in one small thing and 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 did that one thing, but never really saw the links with uh, with how those those systems evolve and interact with others. And yet, you've demonstrated today that you're not like that, and that's a that's a truly great thing to do. So, you've been a very good colleague and a very good friend uh, for the past twenty odd years with me. We've had some great times or some bad times actually in the Himalayas <laughs> and on Ben Nevis on occasion. Um, but you know, but so I'm very honoured to be asked to get to give this vote of thanks. So thank you very much indeed uh, to everybody, and thanks again to Karen.